Part 1. Dorothy. Chapter 1 The Room Near the Campus. April 1959 was coming to the town of Blue River, in the state of Iowa. It was nearly dark in the small room near the Stoddard University campus. The two people in the room that Sunday evening were both second-year students at the college. They were looking at each other in silence. The handsome young man was angry. His plans had been working so well. And now this news had come. But he wasn't going to show his anger that wouldn't help him. He walked to the window, and for a few seconds, he looked out at the lights of the town. He looked at the yellow lights in the streets. He looked at the red light on top of the municipal building, the tower which was the tallest building in Blue River, a mile or two away. Then he turned, and he smiled at the young woman sitting on the bed. I love you, the young woman replied miserably. I don't care about being poor. I don't care about being poor. I don't care about my family. Are you sure that you're pregnant? He asked her gently. Are you really sure that you're going to have a baby? Yes, I'm sure, she replied. The doctor told me that I'm two months pregnant. She started to cry. What will we do? Can we get married soon? Don't cry, the young man said. Everything will be okay. He smiled again. The young woman stopped crying, and she tried to smile too. Oh, let's get married right away, she said. I'm sure that my father will like you when he meets you. We'll be so happy. Well, we could get married immediately, the young man said. But this isn't what I'd planned, Dorothy. You know that. I'd planned to meet your father in New York in the summer, at the end of the college year. I wanted to ask him for permission to marry you then. I want your father to like me, Dorothy, he went on quickly. If we're already married when I meet him, he'll guess the reason. He'll guess about your pregnancy. He won't like that, he'll be angry. He'll stop giving you money. We'll be poor. I'll have to leave college and get a job in a store. And you'll have to leave college to take care of the baby. We'll have to live in a trailer. How will you feel about that? How will your family feel about it? I love you, the young woman replied miserably. I don't care about being poor. I don't care about my family. We'll be happy, I'm sure about that. And I don't believe that my father will be angry. Anyway, we don't have any choice. I'm pregnant. We'll have to get married soon. The handsome young man walked over to Dorothy and put his arms around her. Tonight, he had to pretend to love her. We do have a choice, he said. What do you mean? The young woman whispered nervously. I know someone who can help us, he replied. You don't have to be pregnant, Dorothy. The young woman pushed him away from her. You want me to have an abortion? She said angrily. No, I won't do it. And she started to cry again. Listen to me, the young man said. I do love you, Dorothy. You know that. But I don't want to destroy your life. Your family is rich. You don't know about being poor. But I know about it. You would hate it. Listen. I want to marry you next summer, with your father's permission. Then he'll go on giving you money. We'll rent a little house near the campus. It will be wonderful. But you mustn't have this baby. I won't have an abortion. Dorothy shouted. You won't need an operation, the young man replied quietly. You'll only have to take some pills. I can get them from a guy in one of my classes. His uncle owns a drugstore here in Blue River. He held the unhappy young woman in his arms again. For the next hour, he whispered in her ear. He told her many things that she wanted to hear. 
At last, he looked at his watch. You must go back to your dormitory, he said. It's nearly ten o'clock. I'll meet you tomorrow evening, under the tree outside the pharmacy laboratory. I'll meet you at eight o'clock. I'll bring the pills then. When his girlfriend had gone, the handsome young man put his hands over his face. Oh God, he said desperately. He'd planned everything so carefully, but he'd been careless about one thing. He'd only made love with Dorothy once. He'd had to make her believe that he loved her, but he'd been careless. And now she was pregnant. I can't marry her if she's pregnant, he told himself. I will not live in a trailer with Dorothy and a baby. The young man was desperate because he wanted to marry Dorothy Kingship. He wanted to marry her because she was rich. He wanted to marry her because her father was the owner of Kingship Copper Incorporated. When the young man had found out that a young woman in his economics and philosophy classes was one of Leo Kingship's daughters. His life had changed. He had begun to think of an exciting future for himself. He had thought of a future with lots of money, a beautiful house, and a good job with Kingship's big, successful company. Soon after meeting Dorothy, he had written to the offices of Kingship Copper and asked for some information about the company. The Kingship offices in New York City. Had sent him some brochures. He kept them at the bottom of a drawer in his desk. Every night he took the brochures out and he read them. Every night he looked at the photos of the great Kingship smelting works in Illinois, and he read about how much money the company had earned in the last year. The handsome young man wanted a good future very much. His early life had not been easy. He had been born in the little town of Menasset, near Fall River, Massachusetts. He was an only child. He had no brothers or sisters. His parents had been poor. His mother had hated her husband because he had never had a good job. Her son had become the most important thing in her life. She was interested only in him. His father was dead now. And his mother still thought that the young man was the most important thing in her life. By the time he was eighteen, the young man had started to believe that all women were like his mother. Lots of women had been interested in him. They liked him because he was very handsome. Usually, they were older women with plenty of money. They had enjoyed making love with him. But their interest in him had never lasted very long. Each time, another handsome young man had replaced him after a few months. Now he hated women, but he was still happy to spend their money. Why did Dorothy get pregnant? He asked himself angrily. She's a stupid young fool. The young man was twenty-four years old, five years older than Dorothy. He was older than most of the other students at Stoddard University. He had been in the U.S. Army for a few years before he came to Stoddard. He had fought in the Far East in 1945, the last year of the war. That was where he had learned that it was easy to destroy lives. Although he was angry with Dorothy Kingship, the young man suddenly felt a little sorry for her. She was a very possessive person, and possessive people were difficult people to like. The week before, Dorothy had told him about another of her boyfriends, a Stoddard student who she'd spent a lot of time with. This student had broken up with her before Christmas because she'd become too serious and too possessive about him. Possessive women frighten men. The young man thought. But he understood the reason for Dorothy's possessiveness. Her early life had been very different from his. Dorothy was not an only child; she had two sisters. But her parents had been unhappy like his. 
After the first years of her marriage, Dorothy's mother had been in love with another man for a short time. Eight years later, Leo Kingship found out about this relationship. He had not been able to forgive his wife. He divorced her, although by then she was very ill. The three girls stayed with their father, and soon after the divorce, their mother died. Leo Kingship had never been a kind, loving father. And after her mother's death, Dorothy was afraid of being alone. She had always tried to make people like her. She still did that. Dorothy had told the handsome young man, I'm sure that my father will like you when he meets you. But she had often talked about her father. He was a hard man. He never forgave people if he thought that they had done wrong. The young man was sure that Leo Kingship would never forgive his youngest daughter for getting pregnant. And he would never forgive her if she got married without his permission. What will I do if she won't have an abortion? The young man asked himself. There was one thing that he was happy about. He had always met Dorothy secretly. Neither of them had told any of the other students that they were meeting each other in the evenings. He didn't think that any of them knew about the relationship, and he was sure that Dorothy hadn't told her family about him yet. Although Dorothy had two older sisters, she didn't see them very often. The eldest sister, Marion, had a job in New York City, where Leo Kingship also lived. Dorothy never wrote to Marion or phoned her. Ellen, the middle sister, was at Caldwell College. Caldwell was a hundred miles from Blue River in the state of Wisconsin. The young man knew about the sisters because Dorothy had told him a lot about her family, and he knew that at Christmas Dorothy had argued with Ellen. They hadn't spoken to each other since then. Dorothy won't tell anybody else about the baby, the young man told himself. If the pills work, everything will be okay. Chapter 2 The Pharmacy Laboratory On Monday evening, the young man met Dorothy on the campus, near the pharmacy laboratory. He gave her the two white pills that he had gotten from his friend. You must take both of them, he told her. Take them tonight. You'll probably have a fever for an hour or two. And you'll probably throw up. But then, you'll abort the baby. What will we do if the pills don't work? Dorothy asked him nervously. Don't worry, darling, the young man replied. He smiled. If they don't work, we'll get married right away. Dorothy put the pills in her pocket. Do you want to go to a movie tonight? She asked. I'm sorry, I have to do a lot of work for my Spanish class, the young man said. I'll help you, Dorothy said quickly. I'll come to your room with you. Dorothy was good at Spanish. She was a student in an advanced Spanish class. No, I'll be okay, he said. Go home and take the pills now. Then you'll be okay in the morning. Dorothy didn't understand. The handsome young man wasn't good at Spanish, but usually he didn't care about it. Why did he want to do extra work for his class now? And why wouldn't he let her help him? She was puzzled. Dorothy didn't argue with him. She went back to her dormitory. She sat on her bed, and she looked at the two big white pills. I could lie to him, she said to herself. He would never find out about it. I could tell him that I'd taken the pills and that they didn't work. If I did that, he'll marry me soon. We'd be happy, whatever my father says. But Dorothy didn't want to lie to her boyfriend. They were going to get married soon. And lying wasn't a good way to start a marriage. She got a glass of water from the bathroom, closed her eyes and took the pills. An hour later, 
She had a fever and a terrible pain in her stomach. After another hour, she threw up. But the next morning, she was still pregnant. On Tuesday morning, at two minutes after nine, the handsome young man was sitting in a lecture room on the campus. He wasn't really listening to what the philosophy lecturer was saying. He was thinking about Dorothy. Where was she? She was a philosophy student too, but she hadn't come to the lecture this morning. Was that good? The friend who had sold him the pills hadn't been sure that they would work. If your girlfriend is two months pregnant, it might be too late, he'd said. These pills are really for people who are only a few weeks pregnant. But she can try them, can't she? Perhaps she aborted the baby in the night, the handsome young man thought nervously. Perhaps Dorothy isn't feeling well enough to come to classes this morning. But at a quarter after nine, the door of the room opened quietly and Dorothy came in. She was very pale. She sat down next to the young man and put her books on her desk. She wrote a few words on a page of her notebook, tore out the page, and passed it to him. The pills didn't work. I had a fever and I threw up all night, but I'm still pregnant. The young man closed his eyes. He tried not to show his anger and despair. After a moment, he opened his eyes again and he smiled at Dorothy. He quickly wrote a few words on a page of his own notebook. Don't worry. We'll get married this week. He smiled at Dorothy again and he showed her the page. But he didn't tear it out of the notebook. The young man was thinking hard. Dorothy would want to get married right away. He needed some time to think of another plan. Oh God, he thought. I wish that the pills had killed her. And as soon as he had thought that, something inside him changed. Suddenly, he felt calm. He was in control of his future again. When the class ended, the two young people left the lecture room together. We have to talk, the young man said. Let's go into the town center. We can have some coffee there. I won't go to any more classes today. And you don't have any more classes till the afternoon. Dorothy was still pale, but she was happy and excited. Let's get married tomorrow, she said. No, that's too soon, darling, the young man replied. We have to find somewhere cheap to live. We can't live in my little room. There's a trailer park on the other side of town. Some of the married students live there. I'll talk to somebody about renting one of the trailers. We'll get married on Friday. Then we can have a weekend together at a hotel and move into the trailer on Monday. Do we have to wait till Friday to get married? Dorothy asked. It's only a few more days, the young man said. Okay. I'll write to my sister Ellen tonight. Dorothy said. I'd like to tell her my news right away. That's not a good idea, Dorothy, the young man said. If you tell Ellen about our plans, she'll tell your father about them. He might try to stop our wedding. You can phone your family after the wedding on Friday. They argued for a couple of minutes. But finally, Dorothy agreed. The two young people walked to the town center. They drank coffee in a little restaurant there. Then Dorothy left the restaurant to go back to the campus. The young man watched her leave. I'm going to have to kill her, he told himself. But everybody must think that her death is an accident. Or perhaps a suicide. Yes, people must think that she killed herself. Poor Dorothy. Half an hour later, the young man was sitting in the university library. On his desk were books about famous murders and books about toxicology. He read them quietly for a while, writing notes in his notebook. When he left the library, he had a list of five poisons. 
Any one of them would kill a person quickly. Now he had to get a small amount of one of these poisons. Drug stores were not allowed to sell poisons, but the young man knew one place where he could get them. Stoddard University's pharmacy laboratory. The young man had never been into the laboratory, but he knew that there was a storeroom for chemicals in its basement. All the chemicals which were needed for the pharmacy students' experiments were kept there, and the final year students had keys to the storeroom. The final year students often did experiments without a teacher. The young man had to get into that room, so he'd have to pretend to be a final year pharmacy student. From the library, he walked to the campus bookstore. On the wall of the store was a list of the books which students studied for their classes. He looked at the list for a minute, then he bought a copy of the textbook which all final year pharmacy students had to use. It was a tall, thin book with a green cover. He bought some white envelopes too. A quarter of an hour later, the young man was standing in the basement corridor of the pharmacy laboratory. He was pretending to read the notices on a bulletin board, which was next to the locked door of the storeroom. He was holding the tall green textbook under his arm, together with a notebook and the envelopes. He wanted one of the real pharmacy students to open the storeroom door for him, but that wouldn't be a problem. There were hundreds of pharmacy students. Soon, one of them would come to the storeroom. The student wouldn't recognize the young man, but this wouldn't be a problem either. They couldn't all know one another. There were three large final year pharmacy classes. Whoever came to the storeroom would see the young man standing in the corridor with the final year textbook. Whoever came would think that he was a final year student, but a student in a different class. The young man told himself this, and he tried to look calm and relaxed, but he was very nervous. He didn't plan a murder every day. After a few minutes. A pretty female student came along the basement corridor. She took a bunch of keys from her purse. At the same moment, the young man took his own bunch of keys from his pocket and pretended that he was trying to find the key to the storeroom. The pretty young woman smiled at him. "I'll open the door," she said. And a moment later, they were both inside the storeroom. All around the room were shelves full of bottles. The bottles contained chemicals. Some of the chemicals were powders, and some were liquids. Each bottle had a white label with black letters, which identified the contents. Some of the labels also had the picture of Jolly Roger and the word "poison" in red letters. The young man put the green textbook and his notebook on a desk. He opened them and he pretended to read and take notes. Soon, the young woman had found what she wanted. She put some powder from one of the bottles into a small glass container. Then she went to the door. Goodbye, she said as she left the room. As soon as she had gone. The young man started to read the labels on all the bottles. In a minute, he had found the bottle that he was looking for: white arsenic, as 406. Poison was written on the label. He opened the bottle and he poured some of the powder into one of his envelopes. Then he found a bottle of empty gelatin capsules, and he put a few of them into another envelope. A minute later. He was walking away from the pharmacy laboratory. He was no longer nervous. He was calm and relaxed again. His plan was going to work. In a minute, he had found the bottle that he was looking for. Chapter Three: The Note. That evening, in his small room near the campus, the young man made the arsenic pills. Each empty gelatin capsule had two pieces. 
a smaller one, and a larger one. The young man carefully opened two of the capsules. He carefully filled the two smaller pieces of gelatin with arsenic powder. Then he carefully pushed the larger pieces of gelatin over the smaller ones. He had read about white arsenic in the toxicology books. He knew that the amount of arsenic in the two capsules was about ten times the lethal dose. They contained ten times the amount of arsenic which was necessary to kill someone. Now he had the pills. But he hadn't started to think about the next part of his plan. He had to make Dorothy take the pills. Well, that wouldn't be too difficult. But unless the police believed that Dorothy had killed herself, they would start asking questions on the campus. They would ask where the poison had come from. Then perhaps the pretty young pharmacy student might remember seeing a stranger in the storeroom. The police would show her photos of all the students in Dorothy's classes. That mustn't happen. He had to make Dorothy write a suicide note. That was the difficult problem. When he went to bed that night, the young man still didn't have a solution to his problem. And he didn't have much time to find one. He had told Dorothy that he'd marry her on Friday. If he didn't marry her by Friday afternoon, she would become suspicious. She would write to her sister Ellen and tell her about the baby. Then he'd have to leave college and move to another state. And that wasn't the future that he'd planned for himself. But he wasn't going to live in a trailer with a wife that he didn't love and a noisy, smelly baby. Dorothy would have to die before Friday afternoon. The next day was Wednesday. All morning, the handsome young man worried about his problem. He found the solution during the last class of the afternoon. The last class was Spanish. The students were studying a romantic novel called La Casa de las Flores Negras. The young man hated the book. But while he was trying to translate a passage from the novel, he found the solution to his problem. And as soon as he found it, he was very happy. When the Spanish class ended, he met Dorothy by the pharmacy laboratory, and he took her to a movie. After that, they went to a restaurant. They had coffee and cheeseburgers. Dorothy, the young man said as she finished her coffee. Will you lend me the photo that I gave you? I want to get a copy of it for my mother. Dorothy opened her purse and took out a small photograph of the handsome young man. The words to Dorothy, with all my love, were written across the bottom of it. She gave it to him. I'll give it back to you next week, he said. Okay, but please take care of it, she replied. I want to keep it forever. When they left the restaurant, the young man took her back to his room and made love with her. He felt sorry for her. This was only the second time that they had made love, but it would be the last time too. As soon as she had gone back to her dormitory, the young man burned the photo. He didn't want the police to find anything that connected him with Dorothy. The young man's first class on Thursday was economics. Dorothy was a student in this class too. She came into the room as the lecturer was starting to speak. She sat next to the young man and she smiled at him happily. The young man wrote some words on a page of his notebook. He showed them to Dorothy. Please take notes for me. I have to finish some Spanish translation for my class this afternoon. Then for twenty minutes, he pretended to write a translation of a passage from La Casa de las Flores Negras in his notebook. At the end of that time, he stopped writing and he looked very puzzled for a minute. Then the young man tore a small piece of paper from his notebook. He quickly drew a picture of Dorothy on one side of it. Then he turned it over. On the other side, he wrote some words. 
Can you help me? I don't understand this. Corrido, espero que me perdonares por la infelicidad que causare. No hay ninguna otra cosa que puedo hacer. He passed the piece of paper to Dorothy. She read the words quickly. Then she turned the paper over. She was going to write the translation on the back. But she saw the drawing, and she smiled. She turned to a new page in her own notebook and wrote the translation on that. She tore the page from the book and passed it to the young man. And as he read it, he knew that everything was going to be okay. Darling, I hope that you will forgive me for the unhappiness that I will bring to you. There is nothing else that I can do. Now he had Dorothy's suicide note. During the afternoon, the young man went to a room on the campus where there were several typewriters. Any Stoddard student could use these. He typed an address on one of his white envelopes. Miss Ellen Kingship North Dormitory Caldwell College Caldwell, Wisconsin. She tore the page from the book and passed it to the young man. The young man met Dorothy after her last class of the afternoon. I've just talked to my friend, the friend whose uncle owns the drugstore, he began. He told me that he gave me the wrong pills on Monday. The young man took an envelope from his pocket. These are the right ones, he said. You must take them tonight. But I don't want to take any more pills, Dorothy said nervously. I want to get married tomorrow. Dorothy, listen to me. The young man said, If we have this baby now, it will grow up in a trailer. It will have a bad start in life because its parents will be poor. Please, take the pills, Dorothy. We'll get married soon anyway. But I want to meet your father first. Then we'll have some money. We won't have to live in a trailer. We can live in a real house. We'll be so happy. And we can have a baby next year, darling. No, Dorothy said miserably. She started to cry. No, no. Dorothy, please do this for me, the young man said, putting his arms around her. I know that you want the baby. But you're only thinking about yourself. You aren't thinking about me or the child. Don't give our first child a bad start in life. Suddenly, his voice was cold. If you won't take the pills, Dorothy, I won't marry you. You'll have to ask your father for help. What will he say? They talked for half an hour. Finally, Dorothy took the envelope from him. Take the pills at about ten o'clock this evening, the young man said. If these pills don't work, I'll marry you tomorrow afternoon. I promise you that. Then he held her hand for a moment, and he left her. Slowly and sadly, she walked towards her dormitory. At a quarter after ten that night, the handsome young man went to a telephone booth in the street near his room. He phoned Dorothy's room at the dormitory. Did you take the pills? He asked her. Yes, she said. I took them at ten o'clock. Thank you, darling, he said. My friend said that you will probably feel some pain half an hour after you've taken them. You mustn't worry about it. Don't tell anybody. The pain will soon go. You'll be okay in the morning. Good night, darling. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, she replied. I love you. The young man put Dorothy's translation from La Casa de las Flores Negras into the envelope with her sister Ellen's address on the front. Then he dropped the envelope into a mailbox. He smiled as he walked back to his room. Chapter 4 The Municipal Building The handsome young man was early for his first class on Friday morning. The philosophy lecturer hadn't arrived yet. Three girls were talking in a corner of the room. 
They were excited about something, and the young man was worried. Were they talking about Dorothy? Had somebody found her dead body already? That would be bad. Dorothy's sister Ellen wouldn't get the note until after three o'clock that afternoon. If Dorothy's body was found before that, the police would come to the campus and ask all the students in Dorothy's classes questions. The young man had hoped that nobody would start to worry about Dorothy until the evening. As soon as Ellen got the note, she would phone the university office. Then the police would be sure that Dorothy had killed herself, even before they went to the dormitory. Then they wouldn't ask questions in her classes. The lecturer arrived, and everybody sat down. The handsome young man tried to forget his worries. He tried to listen to the lecturer's words. After a few minutes, he heard the door of the room open, and he heard somebody come in. He didn't turn his head, but when somebody sat down next to him, he looked around. Suddenly, he wanted to scream. His skin felt cold, and he thought that he was going to throw up. Dorothy smiled at him and passed him a piece of paper. He waited a few moments, then he read the words on it. The new pills didn't work either. Oh God! The young man thought desperately. Why did I trust her? She didn't take the pills. She wants to get married right away, so she didn't take the pills. And at three o'clock, her sister will get the note. Then she'll phone the campus, and then there'll be trouble. He stopped listening to the lecturer, and he started to think hard about his problem. The suicide note was on its way to Caldwell. He couldn't change that. He looked at his watch. It was ten o'clock. The note would reach Dorothy's sister's dormitory at three o'clock that afternoon. So in the next five hours, Dorothy has to die. The young man told himself, and everybody must think that she killed herself. What can I do? But soon he had an idea, and he felt calm again. Dorothy believed that she was going to be married that afternoon, and people in Blue River often got married at the municipal building. The marriage license bureau was there. People had to go to the bureau to get a license before they could be married, and there was a judge's office in the building too. If two people didn't want to marry in a church, the judge could marry them as soon as they had their license. And the municipal building is the highest building in the town. The young man thought, "It's fourteen stories high. If someone jumped from the top of it, they would certainly die." At the end of the philosophy class, the young man spoke quickly to Dorothy. "We'll get married today, darling," he said. "Will you wait for me by the pharmacy laboratory? I have to call somebody." I won't be long. Then we can make our plans. The young man went to a phone booth. He asked the operator for the number of the marriage license bureau. He dialed the number. Is this the marriage license bureau? He asked. When somebody answered, When is the bureau open today, please? The clerk told him that the bureau would be open until twelve o'clock. And then from one o'clock to five o'clock in the afternoon, the bureau would be closed for an hour between twelve and one. That was when the clerks went out for their lunch. A few minutes later, the young man met Dorothy outside the laboratory. She looked nervous. He smiled at her. "We'll get married right away, darling," he said. "Don't worry about the baby. Everything will be okay." Oh, I'm so happy that you aren't angry about the baby," she replied. "I want to marry you so much. We have to go to the municipal building to get the license," the young man said. "Let's go there at about half past twelve. You'll have to show a clerk your birth certificate. Don't forget to bring it. Okay."
I have to get some clothes from the dormitory, and I have to buy some gloves, Dorothy replied. I'll meet you here at a quarter after twelve. She kissed him, and she walked quickly away. When Dorothy met him again, she was wearing a beautiful green suit, a green belt, a white blouse, a blue scarf, and white gloves. She had put on some bright red lipstick. My birth certificate is in my purse, Dorothy said. I'm so happy. They rode on a bus towards the town center. It was twenty to one when they arrived at the municipal building. As they reached it, the young man saw something that worried him. He'd never looked at the building carefully before. Now he saw that the sides of the fourteen-story tower were not completely straight. Stories seven to twelve weren't as wide as stories one to six, and the top two stories weren't as wide as stories seven to twelve. If the roof of the twelfth story is very wide, I might have a problem. The young man told himself, "Everything is going wrong today." The two young people entered the building. In the lobby, they looked at a list of the offices on each story. The marriage license bureau was on the sixth story. They got into an elevator and they went up. They got out of the elevator at the sixth story, and they quickly found the door of the marriage license bureau. There was a sign on the door. The bureau was closed until one o'clock. I'm sorry, Dorothy. The young man said, "I'm so stupid. Why didn't I check?" Then he smiled. "I have an idea," he said. "Let's try to get up to the roof. The view from there must be wonderful." They walked back to the elevator, and they went up to the fourteenth story. When they got out, they saw an iron door opposite the elevator. The young man pulled it open. Beyond the door were some iron stairs. The young man closed the door behind them, and they started to climb. At the top of the stairs was another iron door. It hadn't been opened for a long time, and it didn't move easily. But the young man pushed it very hard. And at last, it did open. Dorothy and the young man smiled at each other as they walked out onto the roof. We're so high up here, Dorothy said. Near the door was a tall metal frame. At the top of this was the red light which the young man could see from his window every night. The handsome young man looked around him. Each side of the roof. Was about one hundred and fifty feet wide. All around the edge was a brick wall, about three and a half feet high and a foot thick. But the building wasn't solid. In the middle, it had a big square air shaft. Each side of the air shaft was about thirty feet wide. There was a brick wall around the air shaft too. It was the same height and thickness as the outer wall. Come to the edge, Dorothy," the young man said. "Look at the view of Blue River." He led her to the outer edge of the roof. While Dorothy was looking out over the town, the young man looked down. Only two stories below them was a wide stone ledge. It was the roof of the twelfth story. If she only falls onto that roof, she won't be killed," he thought. I'll have to push her into the air shaft. He led Dorothy back towards the middle of the roof. He leaned over the wall of the air shaft. The sides of the shaft were straight. He could see the ground, fourteen stories below him. Suddenly he felt good. Nothing else will go wrong, he told himself. Everything will be okay now. Let's sit on this wall and smoke a cigarette while we wait," he said. "The bureau will open again in fifteen minutes." He took Dorothy's purse and he put it down near the wall. He lifted her up until she could sit on the wall. Then he got up too and sat beside her. He lit cigarettes for both of them. 
They smoked silently for a few minutes. Then they talked about their future in the trailer park. It will be fun, Dorothy said. We'll have a home of our own. She finished smoking her cigarette and dropped the end of it onto the roof next to the wall. The young man looked at the cigarette end. He saw the red lipstick on it. He smiled and he threw his own cigarette end into the air shaft. He jumped down. Dorothy was still sitting on the wall. The young man held both her hands. I'm so happy that those pills didn't work, darling, he said. You're right. It will be fun in the trailer. Do you really think that? She asked. Are you really happy that the pills didn't work? Yes, Dorothy, he replied. I want to have this baby too. I know that now. He smiled. This was the time to push her. But there was something the young man wanted to hear first. He was going to kill her anyway, but this would give him an extra reason. He knew what she was going to say next. There's something I must tell you, Dorothy said. I lied to you. I didn't take those pills last night. I threw them into the toilet. I wanted to get married to you so much. Will you forgive me, darling? I... Her last word turned into a scream of terror as the young man pushed her with all his strength. She fell backwards off the wall into the air shaft, screaming as she fell. The young man was already running towards the iron door when he heard Dorothy's body hit the bottom of the shaft. Three minutes later, he was in the street. He was walking slowly away from the municipal building. After another minute, he saw an ambulance going towards the building.